Number 10. So get ready. This one has to be low because I'm stretching hard for them to qualify. It's a mighty reach. Renee Montoya and Two Face. Renee Montoya would become the question, and Two Face was Harvey Dent. Boom, acceptable. Anyways, yeah, these two had a bit of an odd, kind of sort of one sided courtship, mostly one sided. This happened leading up to Gotham Central and was not romantic. This one's not cute. No hazelnut lips here. So during No Man's Land, the Batman arc where a giant earthquake devastated Gotham and villains took full advantage and Batman refused help from people who came offering it, like Superman, because, well, he's Batman. Renee Montoya became a go between for the police force who remained and Two Face, who is the leader of one of the sections of Gotham. She would try to connect with the Harvey Dent side of him. And it worked only a little too well. Seeing how tirelessly she worked and how understanding she could be, he fell in love with her. His dent persona would take over for part of this arc too, putting him temporarily in the good column, and at that point they had a good relationship. However, this would all end badly when he discovered she was a lesbian and proceeded to out her to her friends, family, and colleagues, hoping they would all reject her and she would have no choice but to be with him, the only person who truly loved her. Dark stuff. She obviously gave that a hard pass. Number 9. Batman and Batgirl, The Killing Joke, but also secretly some other places. The adaptation of The Killing Joke is now infamous for how poorly received the extended story featuring Barbara Gordon was well received. It was intended to give her more agency and character before her paralysis. It instead, for many fans, reduced her to a whining love interest who was more of a caricature. But some people loved it. Mileage varies. The character development would involve her struggling with balance of violence and being Batgirl, but also her proving she she wasn't just a little girl by sleeping with Batman, just mounting him after they fight on a rooftop. You want it! I made it work! Ugh. This activated for many people the he's friends with her dad alarm bells. But this is a result of a particular creator, Bruce Tim. Since Tim's days on the animated series, he has been hinting that Batgirl had a crush on Batman and that they had a thing. They would actually have a brief thing later in that DCAU continuity. And in Batman Beyond's timeline, which continues that continuity, Bruce Wayne would get her pregnant and she would miscarry in a fight and that would lead to the rift between Bruce and Dick. This relationship, some people like it, many people don't. And even those that do feel it could be handled better than it has been at points. Rooftop sex. Raise the roof. <laughs> Number 8. Batman and Black Canary. For most people, this comes to us from an Elseworlds non canon story, but I'm putting it because everything about Frank Miller's All Star Batman and Robin is hilarious. Well, to me anyway. At one point in this tale, Batman ends up showing up after Black Canary has taken out some bike thugs, and actually, he shows up just in time to help, and the two proceed to make out. It's all mmm, battle tension and fishnets. However, there have been some hints of this in main continuity from way back, like late Silver Age, early Bronze Age. Personally, I don't hate it. This panel about them breaking the bond of loneliness, it kinda got me. I feel like Bronze Age Batman would treat her better than Bronze Age Arrow, or Modern Age Arrow, even though she crossed universes to be with Green Arrow pre-crisis. She'd also be good to all the Robins. Oh god, I think I ship this now. People like to throw this into Elseworld stories, but maybe it's time to shake up that main verse. No more Bat-Cat. Bat Canary. <laughs> no one would stand for it, I know. Number 7. Wonder Girl and Robin We're talking about Cassandra Sandsmark as Wonder Girl and Tim Drake as Robin. Now initially Wonder Girl was with Superboy, Connor Kent, the version that was Lex and Clark's son, well biologically at least, because he was made up of both of their DNA. But then Connor died, and Connor was also Tim's best friend, and so the two grieved together, and in their grief ended up seeking comfort in each other. Comfort that bloomed into a relationship, and a genuine one, a non-Connor wrapped up one. Though there was guilt, much guilt. Guilt. Even more guilt when it turned out that like most people, Connor got better and came back, and his best friend was with his girlfriend. Awkward. Tim Drake had drama, I missed him. He's been a bit more sidelined in Rebirth. Yeah, he's Red Robin, but it's not the same. The Robin cycle in the who's the one we know the least to do what with right now department. Number 6. Spider-Man and Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers. This happened when she was Ms. Marvel. Spider-Man and Carol are contemporaries, and at one point he had developed quite the interest in her, a crush. And she, for all of her sniping at him, does respect him. He actually kind of barters for their date. She needs a favor from him, and he's all, I'll do it if I get a date, and she's like, 
okay, but clearly doesn't mind and is all, I trust you. She probably thought he wouldn't show up given his track record, but he does. So the two end up going out to eat. It's not the worst date either of them have been on. She asks him about Osborne, they chat histories. It's pretty cozy, but they end up not being able to talk about anything but work. Cause really that's the most of what they have in common, but this pairing would creep up a few times. It's not the most popular for either of these two though. Number five, Hawkeye and Spider Woman. Hawkeye is everywhere in the background like a ninja, that pairing you never knew about. But then it's like, oh yeah, Hawkeye. Unless you're a Hawkeye fan, then it's I never forgot Hawkeye. So this started kind of awkwardly. Spider Woman was crushing on him, but he was married at the time. But when she learns he's not married, it's open season. Now's the time for Jessica Drew. The two strike up flirtation and it's awkward and kind of cute. Even starts off with a hey. And if Into the Spider-Verse taught us anything, it's that when you use the hey, that's it, you're in. These two would hook up on a stakeout and they would get one of those steamy covers. You know, the one with the arms locked around each other, those types of deals. This would blossom into one of those banter-based couples that seemed to have a solid base. And it was an organic evolution. She saw, she liked, she waited till appropriate, she conquered. But like most things in comics, so few of these relationships last. No, Hawkeye is not Jessica Drew's baby daddy. Though that could have been cute. He could have had a not so secret plot twist for not doing my classic romance with Natasha family. What a mouthful. Number four, Guy Gardner and Ice. So this was a big romance during the JLI run, that being the Justice League International. It started when Guy was injured and reverted back to his pre-brain damaged personality. So it was really nice and sweet and Ice was super into that. However, it didn't last and he would go back to his more brash, abrasive personality, which while it may have been a hit with fans, was not that much one with Tora. And she tried to stick with him, but found herself being drawn to Superman, who had that sweet personality personality she had first been drawn to in Guy. And it developed into a bit of a love triangle. I wouldn't want to compete with Clark Kent for the ladies. Have you seen his forehead curl? Perfection. Still, this romance is remembered fondly as a kind of mismatched pairing that fans still wish would have worked. Could they have found a way? Maybe. Number three, Wolverine and Domino. This is a very physical thing. These two are drawn to each other on an animalistic, passionate level. And while at times they give in to these urges, there's lots of talk of him picking up on her scent, which can vary in readers from mmm, hot to gross, please no thank you. These two work together on clandestine ops and Domino gets Logan, both sides, the Wolverine side and the man he once was and sometimes still is. Plus Domino is willing to do what needs to be done, which is a trait Wolverine always appreciates because that's pretty much his creed. So these two can talk, but also break things off when they need to. Both of these two are more well known for other pairings though, like Cable and Domino and Wolverine and so many others. Number two, Captain America and Scarlet Witch. You have no idea how badly I wanted to put Wanda and Doom on here, but there was mind control involved so I went whole them instead. Quality content. Also, I just learned people are now calling this pairing Scarlet America and I'm here for it, but also Captain Scarlet or Captain Witch. Think about it. This has happened more than once, such as in the comic Captain America and the Falcon or the Uncanny Avengers, just to name a couple. Eh, couple of fun. These two often strike people as an odd pair, but it's a soft pairing. The two is people who can trust each other with their pain. And also Cap trusts Wanda even after everything, which is a big deal for her. And she sees some of the darker sides of Cap, like his post-war trauma and can help him through it. But like I said, this one comes out of nowhere for some people. But this could maybe work. Give wholesome power couples a chance. And number one, Rogue and Deadpool. Yes, this happened. Here they are making out in the sky. Something comics like to portray as if it would be romantic and not terrifying. This is from the same run as our last number, the Uncanny Avengers, or the team known as Avengers Unity Squad. While on this team, Rogue and Deadpool got to know each other. And Rogue found herself coming to like Wade, who was on more of an even keel at the time. She really started to develop a soft spot for him when she learned about his daughter Ellie and saw how hard he was trying to be a good father. So the two would have a fling, it would be brief and have an artificially constructed moment where she kisses him in the sky and absorbs his powers and his appearance, even though she probably shouldn't have absorbed that part. But it's still sweet because she says that she doesn't care what he looks like. This was adorable, two misunderstood souls together. But now it's treated as a joke, especially in the Rogue Gambit miniseries. I don't know, I thought it was cute. What do you think? Number 10, Catman and the Huntress. So Catman was given an upswing in cred when he was added to Gail Simone's Secret Six series in 2005. He went from being a joke ripoff of Catwoman, even though he was dressed like Batman, to a character with actual pathos and motivations and backstory and a penchant for walking the anti-hero route. This eventually would lead him into contact with the Huntress. This is the pre-New 52, post-Crisis Huntress. So Helena Bertinelli. She was Catwoman and Batwoman's daughter for a bit before Crisis on Infinite Earths. So from the start, these two are attracted to each other, expressed quite strongly in Birds of Prey number 104, where the two have to dance together and can do nothing but have anti-hero hero banter. 
Ultimately, this was a two ships passing in the night type of deal. They met, they flirted, they made out. They flirt when they see each other, or did free rebirth but it was not meant to be. Still, it was fun, but again, it was pushing Catman into Batman territory. Na 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 Catman. They're low because it was no great love to span the ages, but it happened and the world must know. Number 9. Speedball and Squirrel Girl Pre the digital era, one of Squirrel Girl's big traits was that she was an assertive flirt. If she liked you, she made no bones about it. She was quite forward with how she came onto Matt Murdock, and her taste varied. Squirrel Girl had a crush on Speedball, and it turned out he did too. It was all super cute. He kissed her, said he liked hazelnuts. Squirrel Girl's lips taste like hazelnuts. Fun fact. It was all just adorable. She built it up a lot, but these two were not meant to be because Speedball became penance. This is because he was part of the event which launched Civil War, the first one. He was on the team the New Warriors, who were trying to take down Nitro when he detonated and killed 612 people, including 60 kids. This well, it changed Speedball, and he found he could only access his powers through pain. He made a suit that contained 612 spikes, 60 longer ones to represent the kids, and he wears it or wore it while he fought crime. Even though now he can access his powers again without doing this, he still feels guilt and feels that he should feel pain. This was all too edgy and dark for Squirrel Girl, who was horrified in the changes in him. So horrified, she went back in time to try to prevent him from becoming Penance. I must now point out that at this point, they weren't properly dating. That's intense. Boundaries. I'm scared. He would ultimately become Speedball again, without time travel. And these two? Well, it wasn't meant to be. Number 8. Electra and the Punisher Oh yes, this happened, while they were both on Thunderbolts. It actually caused lots of jealousy for Deadpool, because he was crushing on Electra hard. The Punisher and Electra it makes sense on paper, sort of. They're both very intense, though this was brief, and well, it ended badly. Electra actually seemed up to trying to make a relationship work and seek compromise, and she knew that Frank wasn't over his dead family trauma, but was willing to meet him halfway. Well, he was already full on ready to kill her. He also belittles her for her affections for people in general and says it's her weakness. Yeah, it ended badly. She would have had a better time with Deadpool, to be honest. Are they a superhero couple? More like an anti-hero couple. Would we have had enough for an anti-hero couple list? Maybe, but that word doesn't trend as hard. They count. Number 7. She-Hulk and Tony Stark These two are players in the Marvel Universe, so it seemed like an inevitability that at one point they would end up together. It's more of a teammates with benefits type deal. But they have some deep discussions, and Tony respects her as a teammate, a friend, and a lawyer. Before what I like to call a digital era, they were pretty close. She also calls him out on his nonsense, which he oft times needs. His ego can get out of control. Still, these are often quick things, so some people are like, what? That happened? Yes, it did. There's also this joke about how he slept with Gamora and it was lame. That the sex was lame, not the joke. That really varies. Humor is tricky and very subjective. Number six, Tony Stark and the Wasp. This is a new one from the 2018 Iron Man run, actually, and they were really excited about it. This got a very lovingly drawn cover. So Jan and Tony. This is one of those pairings that's like, okay, sure, why not? Most of their stories are about them being busy and having to squeeze in dates, but it's a really smooth relationship. Not too much conflict. Not yet. They also have cutesy puns like, don't worry, I won't sting you. Too late, I'm already stung. No man, give me that villain banter. This was during a movie date. It's also normal and nice. For domesticity, lovers, it's great. But still, for some fans, it's a bit of an okay, did you just draw names out of a hat and be like, who hasn't dated yet? Still, some are just glad she's not with Hank because of that one panel. But there's not only more for that panel, but more to how their relationship soured. Still, if we can retcon away entire universes, why can't we retcon that out? Some things stick no matter how much retcon or reboot scrub you use. Will Tony and Janet last? Probably not. Number 5. Wolverine and Squirrel Girl Yes, you heard that right. Just think about it, cause this happened, largely off panel, but they linger on the hints of it when it comes up, and apparently it ended badly. This is mentioned in New Avengers number 7 from 2010, when Wolverine enters the mansion and sees her going, Doreen, and she goes, James, so you know it was serious. I thought we promised to never see each other again. Then he has to awkwardly tell her that he's on the team, so she'll be seeing much more of him. Squirrel Girl was Jessica Jones and Luke Cage's nanny at the time. Well, their daughter's nanny. Not there, Nanny. This led to speculation that vacillates between being confirmed and unconfirmed that Wolverine, or James, was Squirrel Girl's first love and that he took her virginity. Because these, these are the facts the world needs. The two would grow to at least be cordial. Number four, Spider Man and Kitty Pride. What romance list is complete without a trip to the now infamous Ultimate Verse? Well, many lists actually, but not this one. Marvel's Ultimate Verse did a lot of tweaking of characters' ages and gave us a whole group of heroes firmly teens, lots of them going to school together, or at least learning that they were the 
same age when identities were revealed. Such was the case with Spider-Man and Shadowcat. He actually started dating her after breaking up with Mary Jane because he was tired of always putting her in danger and worrying about her. And Kitty, thanks to her power set and training, could more than hold her own. They would also team up and fight crime together. This would be one of Peter's great loves in the Ultimate Verse and provide much confusion for readers who accidentally picked up an Ultimate Verse comic thinking it was the main verse one. You can make the label as big as you want. Mistakes still happen. Of course, Spidey would die in this verse, making way for Miles Morales, although he would be brought back to life because death in comics means as much as Peter's word that he's going to show up someplace on time. Nothing. Number 3. Black Widow and Daredevil This is actually or was actually one of the great Marvel romances. Matt Murdock and Natasha was serious business, and people who remember have made some cool crossover fan bits. check them out. These two loved each other, and Black Widow would even confess to him that she loved him, which is a big deal for her. But Daredevil was always worrying that it wasn't meant to be, or that they were just too different or too dedicated to their respective missions and different goals. Ultimately, he would prove himself right. He would leave Hell's Kitchen but would grow resentful and miss his city. So he would go back and eventually the two would both be involved in more famous romances. Daredevil with Elektra and currently the big one for Natasha is her and Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier. Thanks to the whole backstory that they knew each other in the Red Room. Which is a great retcon. Not all retcons are created equal. Some are good. Oh man, the salt. I'm sorry. You probably felt that through the screen. Writers remember this happened though, so it comes up. But for new readers, it can be a what? Wait. Number two, Hal Jordan and Arisia. This one is infamous now, and in continuity, we really try not to talk about this. Okay. Hal Jordan and Aritzia. Early, very early in Hal Jordan's continuity, there was a bit of a no alien chicks thing, so he wasn't paired too much with the rest of the core. Not to mention the core took a while to coalesce, it used to just be Hal chilling in space being sent from place to place by the Guardians. Once there was a core, one of the members was Aritzia, a character who was clearly on the younger side who had a crush on Hal, and at first it was well handled. Hal knew about it but would always let her down easy and let her know that she was more like a sister to him, even frequently calling her little sister. Her. Until eventually he had to put her down hard when she showed up in Green Lantern 204 in a new revealing costume to entice him. He finally told her, look, no, you're half my age, you have to stop flirting with me. Well one day, the same writer who brought us Colossus and barely legal Kitty Pride decided that Hal and Arisia were going to be trapped in a cave. And suddenly Arisia is older. She used her power ring to will her body to be older. And the comic will claim that this also went for her mind. But I say to that, sure Jan. She was 14 by the way. So yeah. And well all of a sudden all of his rationale went out the window. Woman body, cave, making out. They would fully get together after this and there's one issue where Guy Gardner spikes their drinks so that they can get together. This whole plot. Later a new writer, Peter David, well a couple of writers later, would just have her break it off with him. And so it was never mentioned again except by people like me. I refuse to let this hot mess go. It must live on and the world must know. And what could beat that? Number 1. The Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. That's right. Twin siblings. Twincest. From the 1610 Ultimate Verse. And yes, they knew they were siblings. And yes, people in that universe will judge Cap for not getting it. What a stick in the mud. So why did this happen? Well, the Ultimate Verse was edgy and extreme, pushing boundaries, many of which nobody was asking to be pushed. Now fans did not react well to this, but the writers kept pushing it, adding more backstory when it was at first more subtle. Like them sleeping together and Wolverine, who is potentially thought to be their father for a bit, watching them from the bushes. So why was all this happening? Well mostly it was build up to kill off Wanda so that people in universe would care and it could be part of the motivation for launching Ultimatum, an event so awful and edgy that it is said to have been the death knell for the entire Ultimate Universe. That's why Ultimates 3, Ultimatum, the whole thing. No. Bad Marvel. Bad. Number 10. Magneto and the Wasp Magneto has been on the side of good before. He's even run Xavier's school for him like when he died. That first time, not the other times. Sometimes. Their friendship is bizarre but strong. So he counts, even though in the arc where this happened, he was in more of an anti-hero mode. This occurred during the massively successful Marvel event Secret Wars, the first one from 1984, not the sequel or the new one from 2015. In this first one, a group of heroes and villains are suddenly plucked from existence and dumped onto a planet to duke it out, to battle each other and see who will win. And when they're grabbed on the side of the heroes, Magneto is there. So hardly a reach, barely a stretch. So in Secret Wars, Magneto 
kidnaps Wasp by trapping her in a metal ball and taking her over to his base as he was driven out by the heroes at the start of the event because they didn't trust him. Well, Charles wanted to keep him there, but he was overruled. He kidnaps Wasp and begins to lay it on real thick. He's not a monster. He wants to discuss a team up. He respects her as a leader. She was leading the Avengers at this point. He thinks she's beautiful and it looks like it's working, making out all over the place. But haha, it was a ruse. She was playing along to learn his plan to take back to the heroes. But for this issue where it's happening, I'm like, man, if only it wasn't so kidnappy and creepy. I can get behind this and say what you want about Magneto, but he's not going to slap her in the face. Number nine, Black Canary and Hawkeye. Yes, you heard that right. You haven't gone mad. But they're from two separate companies, you cry. Why are they only hire fake nerds? Calm down. It's okay. DC and Marvel have done more crossovers than people think. And this occurred during one of them, specifically in JLA slash Avengers. In this story, Kronos, with a K, had smashed the two realities together, creating a combined universe, but not an amalgam one. In this one, they were still separate characters. In the amalgam universe, they were all fused together, like Dark Cloth. So in this story, we see reality shift and reshape itself over and over. And in one of these shifts, not only is Hawkeye a member of the Justice League, but he's with Black Canary, and he apparently crossed dimensions to be with her. The League seems behind this too, with Diana proclaiming that they're a cute couple to Batman. But Green Arrow looks salty and pressed, as he should. A blip, but we'll explore a crossover couple more in depth a little later. Number 8, Superman and Supergirl from Action Comics number 289 from 1962. Kissing Cousins, the comic. This is where Superman marries Supergirl, his cousin. Legit, I'm not making it up. So Superman in this issue is talking about how he would marry his cousin since it's legal on Krypton and he for some reason cares about that even though he's lived his whole life on Earth with Earth values, but I digress. And he does bring up it's legal some places on Earth too. So he's been thinking about this. He actually tells Supergirl that if he ever were to get married, it would be to someone like her. Through Silver Age magic, he ends up on another Earth and there meets a grown up alternate version of his cousin named Luma Lanai. And she is super into the idea. And Clark, he can't resist someone with two L's in their name. Lois Lane, Lana Lang, Lex Luthor. Yeah, this comic has been pushed out of the minds of many readers, and Luma seems to have been permanently erased in Crisis. Sometimes they still bring this concept up, like them flirting, but stop. They're not Luke and Leia, please stop. Number seven, Black Widow and Iron Man. So Black Widow is known for some of her great loves, Hawkeye, Daredevil, and more recently, the Winter Soldier. But for a while, she had quite the thing with Tony. Black Widow actually made her first appearance in an Iron Man story in Tales of Suspense number 52 back in 1964. Her and Tony would start off as enemies, but when she defected and ultimately became an Avenger, the two ended up having a bit of a thing, a romance. Finally, a legit couple. It was more of a physical thing, but still there were panels of pillow talk and banter and flirting. This was different from the ultimate verse, the 1610 universe, where her and Tony had a sex tape and he ultimately had to take her out after they got married because she was using him. No, this was 616. I supported it. Most people didn't though. Tony was not the most popular character at the time, and for many people it was more a question of who should she go back to, Hawkeye or the Daredevil during that time period. Daredevil was a huge thing. He even moved for her, but then he missed his area too much, so they broke up. Number six, War Machine and Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers. Yep, Rhodey and Carol. There were even some people who were rooting for this in the MCU, but we knew that wasn't gonna happen. These two's relationship actually made sense. They both had military backgrounds, were both assertive leaders, they understood the demands of being a hero and work around it. For a time, it was sweet. It showed a human side to both characters you didn't always get to see. A romance can do that if you use it effectively for maximum character development quite quickly, if you're clever about it. He was really supportive. But then Civil War II. Oh, Civil War II. Why? So Rhodey dies leading up to Civil War II. He's killed off super cheaply as a catalyst for Carol to go full minority report. So yeah, he pretty much got fridged, which is an equal opportunity thing, no matter what people say. If you're a supporting character, a love interest, who's a character in your own right, and then you just get killed somewhere else. Bridge. The panel is so dramatic too. No. It would have had more of an impact if Civil War II had been better, if he had stayed dead, and if after he came back, the two had kept on dating. But none of those things happened. Some people still miss this pairing though. When it worked, it worked. Sometimes you just want something wholesome. Number five, Venom and Valkyrie. Well, Agent Venom and Valkyrie. Yes, you heard that right. Don't let your dreams be dreams. When you think about this, this one's kind of polyamorous too, because the symbiote gets in on it as well. Lots of things to think about. This happened when 
when the two were on the Secret Avengers in the lead up to A vs X, an event that had a mixed reception. So these two, what can we say? It was odd, but it was a power couple, and it was different, a quasi couple. A bit of wisecracking alien slash host with a being from another realm. For these two, it was awkward, a kind of step off my girlfriend. What, girlfriend? Did I say girlfriend? Oh no, that slipped out. So slightly derpy guy with above it girl, only they're both cool. This obviously didn't last, but it was a fun blip. Number 4, Star-Lord and Kitty Pride. This was a big one. They even had a comic together, one of those team-up romances, so you know it was serious. This occurred post Guardians of the Galaxy in the MCU, which saw a complete revamping of Star-Lord's character in the comics, rendering him far more in line with the MCU edition. Star-Lord even proposed to her, but Kitty is a strong independent woman who don't need no man. She already had to break off a serious thing with Colossus ages ago, but well, she's back with him since breaking up with Star-Lord. Also, she was Star-Lord for a bit, taking on his Persona. At the start of this, it was a long distance relationship, but eventually turned into Kitty going to be with him in space. This was one that the writers really enjoyed doing, and you can tell. However, it would have meant a permanent shift for one of the characters, either Kitty in space or Peter on Earth. And well, that wasn't gonna happen long term. So these two didn't make it. Plus, sometimes fans get up in arms when new couples go up against a classic like Kitty and Colossus. Number 3, Rogue and Magneto. That's right, Rogue and the master of magnetism himself. Now their big romance happens outside of the main 616 timeline, but there were hints of it there. It specifically started in Uncanny X-Men number 274 when they're both trapped in the Savage Land. Trapped in the Savage Land for the X-Men is like being trapped in a cave for everybody else. No one can resist. The two have a brief thing, but it's over pretty quickly. In the Savage Land, when powers are defunct, when they are, Rogue can touch people, and the time before she had more control over her powers, this was a huge deal. In main canon, it would be a kind of will they, won't they, oh they kinda did kind of thing. She even had a relationship with his clone Joseph, though at first she thought that he was a de-aged amnesiac Magneto and went for it. Their grand courtship would be them paired together in Age of Apocalypse, where they were just a couple. And some fans were into it, while others flipped the table asking where's Gambit. Since then, this still happens, and she's definitely slept with him since in main continuity. She's married to Gambit now at the time of this recording, or was. It's a sore spot. I feel like a gossip rag. Next up, pictures of Cyclops taken from a bush outside his house. You'll never guess what secret X-Force mission he just greenlit. Number 2, Jubilee and Robin, yet another crossover couple. And we're again dealing with Tim Drake. This is from DC vs Marvel from 1996, which would see the heroes from these universes fighting, so team ups. And they would kind of try and match them. So Jubilee would go up against Robin. Well, they kind of fight, but also she's got a huge crush and throws herself at him hard. Despite his assertions that he has a girlfriend, she would even cross universes for him and the two would share a kiss. The idea that Jubilee is a sidekick may leave some people pressed, but in 1996, was that really inaccurate? You decide and leave triggered comments down below. These crossovers were interesting and made all the better by the fact that the writers did try to keep everybody in tone. So who won this fight? Well, Robin, but they were flirting so hard it barely constitutes a fight. He roped her up with a battering thing. Also, I love that when she crosses dimensions to see him, he's not like, oh my god, interdimensional travel. It's just like, what are you doing in Gotham? Batman trained him well. And in at number one, Nightwing and Raven. Teen Titans go. So for a while, Raven was completely in love with Dick Grayson, or appeared to be. But he was with Corey, aka Starfire, but that didn't stop her from making out with him a whole bunch. And she was encouraged by the fact that when she kissed him, she sensed feelings of love. He did love her, but not like that. Although for a while it was hinted that he did. What with her kiss when she's in her white robes and he's in his horrible disco nightwing suit with the high collar, and it's all, oh Raven, I've waited so long. Then after it's all done, is I'm sorry, I don't know why I did that. And he didn't, there was chicanery. This would all end up resolved, and Starfire and Raven would team up in a mean-spirited joke that saw Raven making out with Dick, and only for Starfire to fly into the window and be like, haha, got you, she's not in love with you anymore. Take that, hilarious. I'm worried about Dick, even more now that he's Rick. Give me Dick back, you can snicker all you want. The more we prove that we can say his name like adults, the sooner he turns back into Dick. Dude.